Okay. All right, so today I'm gonna to be talking about roads, roadkill and wildlife crossings, um, which is very appropriate as you'll find out later, but today I'm joining you from um, not so sunny today, Southern California. Um, <laughs> but we'll, we'll get into why that's significant a bit later. Um, but in the United States, there are 4.17 million miles of roads um, and even more miles outside of the US. And this is significant because from, from highways to interstates to municipal and county roads, the entire planet is covered in an extensive network of roadways. And it's very crucial to to us as humans, um, it connects us to, to other people and to places. Um, but with wildlife, it's a little bit different. Um, so to start, we're gonna get into how roadways impact wildlife. Oh no, don't think I shared with sound, so. Let me try again, share sound. Okay. So start with the video. Hitting an animal is a risk anywhere roads are built through animal habitats. And as more roads are built, there are more opportunities for collisions. According to a 2008 study commissioned by the US Congress, the number of animal vehicle collisions was increasing. Experts blamed the rise on more vehicle miles traveled combined with a growing North American deer population. But the official tally excludes accidents that have less than $1,000 in property damage. If you account for minor collisions, unreported accidents, and other variables, experts estimate at least 1 million collisions with large animals, meaning deer, elk, and moose, occur every year in the United States. And while animal vehicle collisions rarely cost lives, they do cost money. In the U.S., wildlife vehicle collisions cost over $8 billion every year, money that is spent on vehicle repairs, medical costs, and other expenses. And although humans tend to survive, animals often get killed. In the same report, researchers found that vehicular traffic threatened 21 endangered species, including the bighorn sheep. Okay, so... So roads are major barriers to wildlife. They not only do harm um, in terms of the physical damage, but they also fragment habitat, which limits physical and genetic connectivity. It can produce light, noise, and chemical pollution um, and introduce invasive species, which gets into this, which we'll go through. Um, one, roadways impede movement and migration. Like I said, they also fragment habitat, they cause direct harm, they can pollute, distress animals by causing noise and light pollution, which can stress animals, and transport along major roadways and inherent fragmentation can introduce and promote uh, invasive species. Starting with just impeding, um, roads fragment habitat, which creates little habitat patches. This inherently leads to habitat loss since you're destroying some of the habitat to create these roadways, but it also impedes animal movement and migration, which can change and limit animal or can influence um, population community dynamics. It also can create what is known as edge effects. Um, in ecology, these effects result from a break in continuity between two adjacent habitats, um, which can lead to changes in environmental and biological conditions. Habitat edges are not in ideal environments um, for plants or animal species, um, as they can present adverse effects, such as um, stronger isolation, uh, the alternation of light cycles, noise, drastic temperature and humidity fluctuations, 
And these highly variable environments can exclude some species, which can lead to decreased biodiversity. It also impedes genetic connectivity. Um, roadways prevent the movement and migration of some species, which can limit gene flow or the exchange of genetic material between two populations. Limited genetic connectivity can have disastrous consequences for a population because lack of genetic of gene flow can lead to a lack of genetic diversity, um, inbreeding as well as just leaving populations vulnerable to drastic changes in the environment. Roadways also can pollute and cause distress to species. Um, they create noise, which can scare or stress sensitive species. Light confuses animals and causes additional stress. And then pollutants left on roads can run off with rain and flood water, um, causing toxicant buildup in um, the soil as well as, as waterways. Um, this additional stress, as well as the exposure to toxicants can lead to physiological changes, um, including the disruption of immune function, um, which can make wildlife susceptible to infectious disease. And then they also introduce and impact native species. In terms of introduction, just inherent travel and transport, um, by humans can introduce non-natives. Um, these edge effects can also um, extirpate certain species because of how we talked about edge effects. Um, the habitat just isn't as good, um, isn't as high quality, isn't continuous. So this can limit certain species um, causing local extinctions. And the introduction of non-native species can lead to really intense competition. Um, Non-natives are often generalists and generally outcompete um, natives. And then what we'll finally get into is direct harm. So we're all familiar with, with roadkill. I'm sure everyone has seen roadkill at some point. Uh, big and small, a huge range of taxa are impacted um, by roads and are vulnerable to road mortalities. Um, we often focus on larger animals because they're more visible, they cause more damage, but reptiles, amphibians, birds, and small mammals are also significantly impacted, um, particularly amphibians um, that migrate for breeding as well as birds of prey that land on roadways thinking another animal is an easy meal um, and then get hit. Um, so not only is there massive harm to wildlife, um, approximately one to two million plus collisions with wildlife per year, as that Department of Transportation report estimated, um, but there's significant costs to humans as well. Wildlife, human, wildlife collisions can cause um, more than 200 deaths per year, um, which isn't super significant considering um, how many collisions there are per year, but it costs the U.S. over $8 billion dollars in property damage, medical costs, et cetera. Um, a lot of serious injuries and deaths from wildlife collisions are often driver related, meaning the most significant damage often comes from attempting to swerve out of the way and losing control of the vehicle. But in some cases, when you, especially when you have a larger animal, um, it can be more, more deadly. Hitting a moose, for example, sweeps the legs out from under it and causes the head and torso to crash through the windshield and the roof, like that picture on the last slide, which can be deadly for both parties. So what can be done to mitigate the effects of roads and limit wildlife collisions? There's a couple different things that we can go, we'll go through. One is just practicing safe driving, um, changing driver behavior. 
Another is to change animal behavior. Um, there's a couple different mitigation tactics that I haven't covered here, um, like uh, wildlife detection systems that either warn drivers by lighting up wildlife crossing signs or try to deter animals by creating noise. Um, but what we'll mainly cover here is using fencing as well as corridors. Um, and then finally, we can advocate for the implementation of things like corridors and fencing. So first is just practice safe driving. While roadkill can't always be avoided, there are some precautions we can take to decrease the likelihood of this happening. One is to just slow down, especially on rural roads and in areas where there are posted wildlife crossing signs. Um, but second is to try and be conscious of when you're driving. Between dusk and dawn is when many animals are most active. So it's important to stay alert and try and avoid driving during this time period um, if you can. Now with newer vehicles, some are equipped with special sensors that can prevent collisions. Um, similar to, to um, pedestrian detectors in a lot of cars, these sensors can detect animals trying to cross the road um, and alert the driver and eventually uh, apply the brakes. Of course, these don't always work perfectly, um, but there's a lot of potential here um, when combined with other mitigation strategies. Which brings us to fencing. Fencing along roadways is one of the most cost-effective ways to deter animals from crossing at specific points. When proper fencing is installed, it can reduce roadkill by over 54%. So you want a two to two and a half meter high wire mesh fence. And then it's most effective when equipped with escape routes or one-way gates like the one shown here. Um, these one-way gates give wildlife a way out if they ever find themselves on the same side of the fence as the road, but it prevents them from coming back in. Okay, so just how effective fencing alone is, um, is, is questionable. Um, and we'll see that in this video. In some places, highway planners have solved the problem by building fences to keep animals off the road, a relatively cheap solution that has been proven to reduce roadkill by over 50%. But although fencing reduces roadkill, it neglects a wider problem. Besides the risk of collision, roads harm animals by dividing wildlife populations and limiting their ability to find mates, food, and other necessities of life. In Canada, wildlife scientist Tony Clevenger has been studying how road construction affects animals in Banff National Park. It can have important impacts on the reproductive success because females aren't being able to access important spring habitat uh, because they're not crossing the highway. So it's, it's, it's important that, that we maintain these movements and we maintain this access to the important biological resources throughout the year. And wildlife crossing structures do that. Beginning in the 1980s, authorities began installing a system of underpasses and overpasses in Banff. The structures were designed for animal use only and were located where animals were likely to cross the road. The data speaks for itself. For example, here in, on the trans canada Highway in Banff National Park, there were, were on average more than 100 elk vehicle collisions per year before the fencing and the wildlife crossing structures, and it now it's down to less than a half dozen. Uh, so these are huge reductions by having these mitigation measures in place that are improving motorist safety, they're saving lives, and also in a protected area like Banff National Park, it's important because the objective of this national park is to protect wildlife. Instead of blocking the road entirely, planners used fences to funnel wildlife towards the crossing structures, which were planted with native vegetation. A few species, like deer, elk, and moose, immediately started using them and were followed by more skeptical species, like wolves and grizzlies. Within a few decades, even the most reluctant species, like lynx, had adapted to using the crossings. In 2012, a male grizzly was recorded crossing the structures 66 times in one summer. By crossing the highway, the bear's habitat expanded to include potential mates on the other side of the road, which decreases the likelihood of inbreeding. 
what we've been able to show is that by having these overpasses and underpasses in place, we've restored genetic connectivity across the highway here in Banff National Park. Wildlife crossing structures are fairly common in some parts of the world, particularly in Western European countries like the Netherlands. But there are relatively few in North America, and the success of the Banff crossings has encouraged similar projects in the United States, like this rendering of an overpass being built in Washington State. And in 2012, the Wyoming Department of Transportation built an overpass that reconnected an ancient migration route of the pronghorn antelope. So what the video is, is showing is fencing is most effective when we combine it with other strategies, particularly wildlife crossings. In fact, one study found that fencing combined with these wildlife crossings where you funnel to it um, can be 84% effective in reducing large animal mortality. There are several different crossing types that can be implemented to provide a safe corridor, which I'm going to go through now with a couple examples. So the first is overpasses, which are bridges that pass over a roadway. Um, examples include bridges like the one we just saw in Banff, um, as well as this one in, in Montana, but they can also provide um, safe crossing for other species that we don't often think about, like these crabs on Christmas Island who migrate from forest back to the ocean um, using this bridge, or these cockatoos using this rope bridge that was designed for squirrel gliders, or this sloth that uses what is essentially a rope tied between two trees over a roadway. Uh, the second is underpasses, which pass under roads. Um, these are extremely effective, especially for smaller animals, like this hedgehog using the Hedgehog Highway that runs through garden walls in the UK, um, as well as these salamanders in Massachusetts, um, and these tunnels that pass under railways um, to provide turtles a safe crossing. Um, additionally, larger tunnels can be built, like this one in Banff, where we have a grizzly crossing, um, or this tunnel for little blue penguins in New Zealand. The last that we'll go through is culverts. Culverts aren't often used or implemented specifically as intentional wildlife crossings, but they're designed to connect streams and carry water under a roadway. But they make really excellent wildlife crossings. Um, because they serve multiple purposes. Um, yeah. Go through some more examples in the US. Um, like that video talked about, ones in the US aren't particularly common, especially larger uh, bridge type overpasses, but there are a few interesting examples that we can look at. Um, the first is this, Toad's Hollow, um, which is essentially just like a little drainage tunnel that goes over um, a major road in, in Davis, California, and it allows amphibians to cross under um, as they migrate for breeding purposes. There's also this bridge, the squirrel bridge called Nutty Narrows uh, in Longview, Washington. Um, that runs over several of the roadways uh, throughout the city. Um, they've implemented several additional ones since the original was installed. Um, and I've seen really good success with that. Bridge-wise, we have this one in New York, Newark um, over the I-78. And this one, the over the I-80, um, this one you might have seen before, uh, lots of viral videos going around um, of animals using this crossing. Um, it was mainly designed for deer, but they've seen pretty much everything from deer to 
uh, porcupines and bobcats, coyotes, squirrels, just about everything is using this, this uh, overpass. Finally, there's Alligator Alley in the Everglades. Um, forget how many miles it is exactly, but there's a major highway that runs through the Everglades. Um, and they've implemented several different underpasses throughout this area um, that allows wildlife to cross under. So you have things like this alligator, but it has also been particularly effective in allowing uh, the Florida panther to have continuous habitat, um, which is significant as it's an endangered species. So the final example we're going to go over is the Walls Anberg Wildlife Crossing, which is a proposed wildlife crossing um, that's near and dear to my heart. Um, because it exists in the Santa Monica Mountains. So the Santa Monica Mountains is the world's largest urban national park, which we've gone over if you were at my, my master's talk, um, but it's home to some pretty famous pumas. It exists right here. I am actually from Thousand Oaks, which is right here. So that's where I am right now, but most famous, among these pumas is P22, or the Hollywood cat. He lives um, in the 4,000 plus acres of Griffith Park, which is an extremely urban park, um, surrounded on all sides by freeway um, and dense urban space. He has lived there for the majority of his life, um, just by himself. There are no other pumas in that area but there's plenty of deer for him to feed on. Um, but the Santa Monica Mountains itself has been a hub of urban wildlife research for over 20 years. Um, and what they've learned in this period is this place is a pretty challenging place for wildlife to live, especially in larger wildlife, uh, because of the significant fragmentation that freeways in particular cause. Um, LA has several major freeways running through it, that are typically six or more lanes wide. Um, and so without places to cross, a lot of animals become isolated. And so what the Walsenberg Wildlife Crossing will do is connect um, two patches of habitat that are owned by the San Juan Mountains um, and the Mountain Recreation Conservation Authority. Um, to make more continuous habitat. Liberty Canyon is where the wildlife crossing is being proposed. It's about 10 miles down the road from my childhood home. Um, and it's an ideal location for this wildlife crossing because there is natural habitat on both sides. Um, light is very limited there as well. There are no freeway lights along that portion of um, Highway 101. Um, And so over these past 20 years, this is probably the largest, this, this habitat fragmentation by roads is probably the largest challenge that faces wildlife in this area. Um, and so in connecting, reconnecting this natural habitat, they're hoping to um, essentially reestablish genetic connectivity. And the major driving factor for this crossing is the mountain lions in this area. Um, after studying them for over 20 years, what we know is that there's very little genetic variation within this population, and there's a lot of evidence of inbreeding. And so what they're seeing more recently um, is that they're showing very obvious signs of that. Um, like tail kinks, like this one in this in this camera trap photo, um, but there's obvious signs of of reduced fertility as well. But this proposed crossing will reconnect mountain lions as well as countless other populations of wildlife in this area, um, including the bigger animals they study, like bobcats and coyotes, um, but 
even things like harvester ants and southern alligator lizards will benefit from this crossing. This crossing is currently just proposed, um, but it is the largest wildlife, it will be the largest wildlife crossing in the world um, at over 200 feet long and almost 200 feet wide. Um, and it's extremely expensive. It's $88 million. Um, it's been in the works for over 10 years now. And they recently broke ground um, on Earth Day of this year. And so just the sheer cost of this kind of brings us to advocacy. Um, one of the biggest ways you, as an individual, other than trying to practice safe driving, can impact um, whether or not we have these wildlife crossings is through advocacy. Like I said, wildlife crossings, especially overpasses, are extremely expensive, uh, even the smaller ones. Um, so doing things like donating your time or your money, as well as voting and encouraging representatives to study and implement wildlife crossings um, are one of the best ways that you as an individual can see more of this mitigation implemented. Uh, in donating your time, you can help scientists study rare ecology as a citizen scientist or a community scientist. Um, there's lots of different projects. Um, I haven't found one specific to, to Wisconsin, but there's, there's a huge one that is underway in, uh, in California managed by UC Davis that allows you to report roadkill. Um, and they have a very up-to-date map that you can look at. Um, but you can report things on, you can report roadkill on uh, websites like the Global Roadkill Network. Um, they also have an iNaturalist um, project, but you can also just report wildlife um, mortalities to your local Department of Transportation or county sheriff. Um, and not all departments track these things, but some do. And more recently, um, I don't think I don't think billion is correct. It's three hundred fifty million dollars were advocated to wildlife crossing projects in all fifty states as part of the recently passed infrastructure package. Um, so, like I said, if you don't have the capacity to donate money or your time, um, the best way is to vote and advocate to your representative to increase funding to projects such as the Wallace Amber um, Wildlife Crossing. So uh, this is from Alligator Alley. Um, but there's no sound with this video, just, just some fun uh, clips of wildlife crossing under. Um, and I can answer questions while we watch this. Hey, Amanda. Yeah. So you showed one video that was like a badger and a coyote. And I'm looking at yes. this one and there's like everything from bears to rabbits. Like how does this affect predation of the and interspecies hangouts, I guess? Is there any evidence on that? Like does it benefit um, predators more than prey? Because the predators just kind of hang out at the crossing and pounds or well hi baby it's not typical that um anything really hangs around these crossings because i mean it might be it might be a little bit different on larger like overpasses um like like the wall sandberg wildlife crossing that's been proposed um 
but in situations like these where where you have a more limited space where you're crossing um animals don't typically like to hang around there because of the noise um essentially the roadway creates a lot of stress and so they just want to pass through quickly um and so them just like hanging around isn't so much of an issue. Um, yeah. Totally makes sense. I also wonder, because um, you know, with like bird migrations and migrations, how light pollution is such a, a big deal. But I feel like you don't really hear much about road light pollution, like major mm -hmm. roadways and stuff. So I just wonder, like, I mean, I don't even know if this is a direct question, but it's more of just like a thought, like, about how if wildlife crossings could have any sort of impact on, like, bird migration in terms of, like, light pollution I don't know I'm just thinking I, it made me realize it made me think more about road light pollution I guess yeah um I haven't looked specifically into like studies that are looked for studies that consider like bird migration often these crossings are implemented because of larger species mm -hmm. um but I know that in the UK, they have these, um, I forget what they are. They're essentially like 